Well, I'd like to take uh, a little bit of opportunity, uh, opportunity here to uh, introduce Carol. Uh, Carol has uh, been in the environmental field for her entire career. And she's worked for the Forest Service. Uh, she's worked for Clackamas County Water and Environmental Services. Uh, she works now for the Clean Water Services uh, office being, uh, I don't know, a mile or two from Hillsboro. Uh, she's currently leading the development of a climate adaptation roadmap. If you uh, want to. Excuse me. Where is she about? Thank you. Uh, we were also planning on having a second speaker today, and she may show up about 1230 here. And this is uh, Jamie uh, Hughes, and uh, we'll see. She had something, kind of an emergency come up, uh, work-related. So we hope, hopefully she can make it. But with that, uh, Carol, I'd like to turn it over to you. and. Uh, Thank you for your agreeing to spend time with us. Sure, happy to be here. Um, sorry, Jamie isn't here yet. She's she's sitting in a regulatory meeting. We got our permit yesterday, and now they're shopping it around and talking to our to folks about what's going to be required. Um, my name is Carol Murdoch, and I'm a in, I'm the integrated planning uh, practice leader for Clean Water Services. And what that means is I sort of help to guide the integration of the work between the departments at, at CWS, which is no small feat, let me tell you. Um, but we've been doing it for a couple of years and making some good progress there. But one, one of the other things that I'm involved in is the development of a climate adaptation plan for the district. We've had sort of fits and starts over the past several years on doing uh, working on climate adaptation, but now there's sort of a, this concerted effort that I've been leading and I wanna share that with you. But for, for some of you that may not be familiar with, with Clean Water Services, I wanna give you a little context um, of our situation here in the Tualatin Basin that sort of uh, helps us sort of understand why we have to do the things we do. Um, first of all, I wanna share my screen and show you a couple of maps so you can see where we're, where we're at. Let's see. Let's see. Let's see if this one will. So here we go. So um, Clean Water Services service area is basically um, the the urban areas in in Washington County, Oregon. Um, we. Uh, Let's say Washington County is about a little bit over 600,000 people now, which is kind of amazing. It's, it's grown a lot just in the last eight years that I've been in, in the clean water services. We operate four water resource recovery plants um, in Durham, Hills, in, uh, Hillsboro, Forest Grove, and there's another one I can't think of right now. Oh, uh, Forest Grove, Hillsboro. Durham and Rock Creek. And Rock Creek is, is sort of up higher in the watershed, kind of um, in this, still in the urban area, but kind of in the Hillsboro area, kind of to the west. So the, the situation with, with uh, Clean Water Services is we discharge to a really small river. Uh, the Tualatin River is the only river in Washington County, and we and it's very sensitive. It actually used to dry up, literally dry up in the summer. Um, and so uh, be, because there's so much going on in Washington County in terms of the economy. So Intel Corporation is in Washington County. Uh, Nike World Headquarters in, is in Washington County, and there's a lot of high tech. And some people call uh, Washington County the economic engine for the state of Oregon. So there's a lot riding on the health of the river and especially for clean water services as a organization because the river is, uh, you know, low, is really, like I said, it, it used to dry up. We have to do a lot of things to support it. And it's really prone to algal blooms in the summer. And there have been some algal blooms in the river that have actually shut down the river. The public health 
Authority actually shut down the river because of the algal bloom problem. And that was because there were a bunch of small wastewater treatment plants that were not working very well. And the river was not healthy because of that. And so, and that's why Clean Water Services was actually formed. So, um, and be, so be, like I said, because we discharge to the Tualatin, we have to um, kind of go above and beyond what is usually required for wastewater treatment. And we go beyond, we, we have two advanced treatment plants, one at Rock Creek and one in, at the Durham plant. But we also have a, a suite of other strategies that we have to do to be able to support this river because it is so sensitive and so much is, is, run, is relying on it. You know, the economy of Washington County is relying on the health of this river. So some of the things that we do is we, we augment the flow. We have a water right in Hag Lake, uh, Henry Hag Lake, which is right up here. Um, and we, we uh, release stored water. And we used to, and I'll, I'll show you uh, some excerpts from a flow report that actually Jamie put together recently that'll sort of sort of help to help you understand the situation we're dealing with. Um, so we we release uh, stored water. We also augment the flows in some of the tributary channels just to support biodiversity and uh, that kind of thing. We also have a resource recovery, a pretty robust re resource recovery uh, program where we actually pull phosphorus and other nutrients out of the waste stream, and then we turn it into fertilizer. And it's you can you can you can find it at Fred Myers. So we have all these kind of wacky, sometimes people think wacky strategies that we have to do to sort of deal with uh, our regulatory requirements on the river. For instance. Um, Phosphorus is, is something that we have to deal with. There's also other nutrients, but then the biggest problem that we have is temperature. Because the, the water, the, the Tualatin gets really low in the, uh, in the summertime, especially during sort of the TMDL, temperature TMDL period, which is in July. And we used to, we used to, uh, we used to augment the flow in, in a short period of time but now it's, it's getting longer and longer as uh, climate change reduces the amount of water that we have and we have to start augmenting the flow earlier. So like I said, um, Jamie put together this flow report and uh, this is the 2021 report. And she talks about in this report, um, some of these, some highlights. You guys remember the heat dome and what that did and what, what that looked looked at, but like uh, record temperatures were set at every tributary in the Tualatin River with continuous temperature monitoring. And water temperature on June 28th exceeded 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so climate change is definitely one of those major factors that we have to deal with, especially as it, re as it relates to our ability to meet our regulatory requirements. So some of the highlights she talks about in this report is Hag Lake, which is where we um, release our, sto our stored water from, and Barney Reservoir is another one. Uh, always fills up in the, not always, but mostly fills up every winter. Um, Barney Reservoir is another one where you have a, a smaller water right, and that one filled as well. Um, the regulation of the river, which meaning when we started to augment the flow, began in May 7th and continue, continued all the way to October 25th. We used to do this for a really short period of time and I'll show you the graph of what that looks like. Um, you know, rainfall was really, really scarce and re remained scarce through September. And there were record lows of monthly rainfall were set at most sites in April. Um, most of the Tualatin River and tributary sites had set records for low flow in April and early May. And then um, a heat dome came in, caused record heat throughout the region. We actually almost didn't meet our temperature requirement at the point of discharge at our Durham plant. Um, and for the first time, uh, the, the seven day average stream temperature standard was exceeded at every monitoring site on the Tualatin River. Uh, so that's kind of the things that, those are the highlights from that report. 
and kind of sort of gets gives you sort of an idea of what we're dealing with. So this is the graph I was going to talk to you about. This is the historic history of regulation of the water rights for non-irrigation, which means this is where the time periods where we were augmenting the flow. So in 1994, we started augmenting the flow in you know July and we ended it in October. But if you look down here to 2021, you'll see that we started augmenting the flow in the Tualatin River in May. And we continued to augment the flow all the way to October. So we have a limited water right in Hag Lake that we share with the water providers and the irrigation district, right? And we're having to augment the flow in the river a lot longer than we ever had. And that's a problem because this is our primary way to, to you know, cool the water in the Tualatin River so that we're not impacting it so much with our treated effluent. I'm gonna stop sharing that. So let me show you the adaptation plan. And I hope that sort of helps you to understand the situation that we're in. And we've been in this situation forever in terms of discharging to a small river, trying to support a, a big population base that keeps growing and an economy uh, that requires, you know, a, a stable source of, of water. Um, and, and it's really paramount to our organization that we start to think about or, or start to plan for adaptation to climate change so that we can continue to uh, provide the services that we provide. So that's why we're, we're doing the work we're doing right now with the action plan. So let me just share that. Um, let's see, I haven't used Zoom in a while, so bear with me. Um, okay. Can people see this or do I need to make it bigger? So is it big, I, I'm sorry, I can't hear anybody. I can see it. Yeah, I can see it. Thanks, appreciate that. Okay, so There's a lot of things, so all of the things I've talked about, all of the strategies that we currently utilize, I, I feel like we have in some ways a leg up on some of the other utilities that are out there dealing with this. And that's because of all the work we do now to support the resilience of the river. It's not just flow enhancement and resource recovery. We also have, a, we meet part of our thermal load requirement by, generating thermal credits because we plant trees along the, the main stem to Alton River and many of the tributary channels. We have like over 25 miles of riparian shade uh, along the tributary channels and the main stem. Um, but there's a couple, there's, I'm gonna go, what I wanna focus on first is, is some things that we are not doing that we should be doing. And when I was working on, the, on this roadmap, I did a lot of research into how other, other utilities, especially, there's a lot of information out there on how water utilities are dealing with things, but, and there's less so in terms of how stormwater, wastewater utilities are working on it. But one of the things that we are not doing that we really need to do, and that was came out of this research that I did, was to really invest in understanding climate science and how it evolves. And what that looks like is really developing a relationship with our, the climate scientists at o Oregon State University and at UW. And there's a University of Idaho has done some really good work on climate science. So we really need to, to understand how the climate science, you know, the limitations and the benefits of the climate science, but also this ongoing understanding of how it's changing so that we can plan for that. Um, the second thing that we need to do that we're not doing currently is plan for a range of potential future conditions. 
And what that looks like is, is doing what's called scenario planning. A lot of folks are doing scenario planning, especially the water providers. And what it, what it is, is trying to like deal with the fact that it's uncertain, that you don't know what it's going to be like and plan for, do your best to, to think about what the scenario you're going to be operating in is going to look like. And that has to do with water supply, but it also has to do with growth and other, other sort of stressors uh, that could be put on, uh, you know, could add, add additional stress to the river and the health of the river. Clean Water Services has a watershed wide permit. It's the first one in the country. And that allows us to work across the entire watershed to meet our permit requirements. Um, so we do a lot of work in the upper, upper Tualatin and Basin with our partners at US Fish and Wildlife, at the Soil and Water Conservation District, in the agricultural community to do that, you know, implement those shade programs to really shade the river. And, and the whole model, the whole business model with CWS is about partnerships. And we do a lot more with our partners than we could ever do by ourselves. And because of it, we keep our rates state steady. So scenario planning is really, you know, getting a group of people together that can talk about and think about under these different climate scenarios, these different emissions scenarios, what will the conditions look like for clean water services? Um, and how do, we, uh, how do we develop sort of these plausible conditions under which we're, you know, we can identify the potential impacts to our operations, to our systems, to our street strategic objectives, and most in importantly, our long-term compliance. So really getting people together and start having them start to think about in this unknown, unpredictable situation, how are we going to understand how we're vulnerable, where we are vulnerable, and how can we develop strategies, even though we already do all this stuff that I've already talked about, is it going to be enough? We don't, we can't answer that until we really start to think about it. So the other piece of this, once we develop these, scenario, these scenarios and we can talk about what the potential impacts might be, we can start to do vulnerability assessments. Where are we vulnerable we, you know, of our critical assets and also our treatment processes and our long-term compliance? Where are we going to really struggle to comply with the regulations as we're dealing with these climate, uh, uh, you know, an un climate change? So um, the next sort of, I'm walking down and I'm sort of in number, on number four here on the left-hand side where you see the objectives. So these are all the objectives that we have and these are the fiscal years in which these are going to be implemented. So it's not all piled up into one thing. It really focuses on this first piece was just really understanding where we're vulnerable, what, what kind of conditions might we be working under and how do we assess what the impacts might be. So, um, and the next piece is really these vulnerability assessments of critical assets and processes and, and long-term compliance. And then developing tools that sort of help to embed uh, climate awareness and climate adaptation into our planning, into our operations, into our uh, capital projects or capital improvement projects and infrastructure projects to make sure that we don't have infrastructure that might fail which would cause us to have an, uh, you know, an unanticipated additional expense to deal with failing infrastructure. Um, the other one is an effort that's ongoing and Jamie's a big part of this one is really the development of a long-term strategy for regulatory compliance. And so we have, I don't know if you guys know Raj Kapoor, but he's awesome and he put together an integrated plan uh, based on the EPA's um, template to really look at uh, a bunch of objectives that we would need to do and so that Clean Water Services has the flexibility to continue to, to use these sort of innovative strategies to adapt and, uh, and, and continue to adapt so that we can continue to meet our, our compliance. And so that's 
not only a list of objectives that are sort of at the constituent level, but also we want to be able to utilize the strategies, you know, very unique strategies because of the situation that we're in. Um, the next piece really is this, um, then it's, this is the ongoing effort really around long-term compliance. And there's really a, a group of folks are working on sort of developing these workshops so we can get the right people in the, in the room to talk to us about how would we tackle and prioritize each of these objectives in this, in this long-term compliance uh, document that we're going to try and get in front of DEQ. And one of the major pieces of that is developing a communications plan that will engage DEQ in these negotiations. So we can partner with DEQ on how the district can uh, continue to meet its requirements. Uh, what I said earlier is um, the district really uh, basically implements what's called a, uh, integrated, uh, an IWARM, an integrated water resource management uh, is how we deal with the uh, the health of the river and our ability to meet to meet our uh, requ uh, regulatory requir requirements, and that's really just all the strategies that I've been talking about, which include reducing the thermal loads at the plant, uh, reducing reducing effluent temperature, generating thermal credits by planting trees, and these are native trees and shrubs, which we're also working on um, in terms of adapting our plant palette because a lot of the species that we're seeing now are dying. So we don't plant uh, Western red cedar anymore. We don't plant Douglas fir anymore. Um, we have a problem, we have, we have a, a emerald ash borers attacking our ash trees. So we're gonna have to adapt our plant palette to be able to, to um, you know, continue to have our shade program and also keep our shade program because if, you know, if all of our plants die, um, that's a big expense for the district and a lot of thermal credit that we're not going to be able to continue to uh, create. Um, another critical piece really is this, like I said earlier, the release of stored, wa stored water from the two reservoirs is, is absolutely critical. We went through a long process over many, many years trying to increase the storage at Hag Lake, working with the Bureau of uh, Reclamation, but that just with our, you know, our leadership just decided to walk away from that. So now we don't have, we don't have that. And we have to back that up with additional uh, strategies. And what we're, what we're focusing on really is our uh, building up our reuse program. So we're gonna expand our reuse water program dramatically. Um, and sort of balance that out with, so balancing out, managing the flow in the water in the river with um, uh, a reuse program that would actually take water out of the river, if you think about it. So that'll be an interesting sort of thing to, to figure out how to sort of marry the two, those two and balance those two strategies. Um, the next one is really about, can, you know, convening our partners. So like I said, uh, our, business meant, uh, our business case is really built, built around partnerships. And so the next one I want to talk, talk about is sort of establishing a community of, of practice to integrate climate adaptation into water resource management in the basin. And so that means continue with our relationship with all of our conservation partners in the basin. Um, like I talked about, we, we, we work with Metro, we work with SWCD, we work with the Watershed Council, we work with everybody um, to leverage their goals and our goals to really continue um, managing the water resources of the basin together as a community. And that will include a sort of an expanded uh, um, role for the cities and the county. Um, our board really wants us to work more closely with our cities and, and as less of a regulator and more as a partner. 
So that means getting a group of people together to sort of talk about, because a lot of these, you know, our cities are, some of our cities are working on climate adaptation and some of the conservation organizations we work with are working on climate adaptation. So getting the people together to sort of develop this community of practice really helps. And it would have helped me, frankly, in terms of my ability to, to help pull together this adaptation plan, if I'd been able to reach out and talk to more people in the community that were that working on climate change. Um, the, the next piece I already, I have already talked about a little bit, which is adapting the native plant palette to ensure ecological re resilience in, of riparian and wetland enhancement projects and support biodiversity. Um, uh, the next thing is number 10, which is understand the risk of wildfire ignition and spread related to CWS efforts to enhance riparian corridors. So this is a couple, this is a twofold thing really focused on wildfire. So the people who are, you know, our natural systems group are the ones that do all the work to put native plants and create that shade credit. And they, they are concerned about the outbreak of wildfire, which I remember we're working a lot outside the urban area, but also in the urban area to sort of understand um, the risk factors for wildfire in those stream corridor sites, but also mitigate that potential risk because some of the people that live near these are a little concerned about wildfire. So we're gonna try and address that. Um, this next piece uh, was a project that I worked with, with the Joint Water Commission and the Soil and Water Conservation District and the Watershed Council to develop a uh, wildfire protection plan for the, for the source water protection area, which is the area above the two reservoirs. So we're very concerned about protecting water supply infrastructure and the base and the, uh, the natural areas above that infrastructure. Um, so we developed a plan and that plan is we're seeking funding right now uh, to be able to implement some of the uh, recommendations that came out of uh, that wildfire protection plan. Um, as I said before, expanding water supply alternatives means like developing markets for water reuse. So there's a, a project manager that's been working for a couple of years on increasing the amount of water reuse that we um, can put on agricultural lands and also sort of park lands. Um, that's a big effort. There's a lot of eggs in this basket, frankly. Um, and we might want to start thinking about uh, in that scenario planning exercise, start thinking about what if we don't meet our target here for whatever reason, what other strategies are we going to use? Um, the next one is really evolving the stormwater program to enhance partnerships with the cities and counties and focus on attaining sort of broader community benefits. And what that is about is about really integrating the work we do in, with the stream corridor uh, enhancement and the floodplain enhancement that we do with land use decisions, trails, and open space planning efforts. So that's really it's sort of getting, you know, helping the cities manage their stormwater and also get the benefit of having, um, you know, riper riparian shade along their uh, corridors, like uh, THPRD routinely um, builds trails, right? Builds trails and those trails are now uh, shaded with a lot of our native plants. So that's a partnership that we've had for years with THPRD to uh, sort of get access to their land that doesn't cost us anything. Um, to, to get shade credit and what they get are like tr really nice, you know, natural areas where people can get out of the heat. Um, so we're winding down here, we're almost at the bottom. And this, this one is really focused on an ongoing effort <clears throat> that our folks at uh, Treatment Plant Services have been working on to sort of engage significantly with uh, the staff uh, to really start to, to figure out ways to, of reducing the energy reliance on external sources at the treatment plants. Um, so the first thing really is to develop a sort of coalesce all of these 
uh, efforts that have been going on into a, a district-wide energy strategy. So they've been doing things sort of ad hoc, but it's it's really piled up in terms of the reductions of energy that we've been able to get at the plants. Um, and then sort of some some ideas on how we might might monetize these reductions in in greenhouse gas emissions. We, there's a one of the strategies we're thinking about is a sort of similar to the blue sky power thing. I don't know if you guys are involved in that, but they will, uh, you know, you play a little extra and they, and your energy comes from, you know, alternative sources. Uh, and we're also researching carbon sequestration potential. Our, our riparian enhancement sites have a significant amounts of uh, carbon sequestration potential. So is there something we can do there? Or can we be like a middleman that generates the credits and someone else buys them, not necessarily from clean water services, but you know, like how would that work? Um, so really it's sort of a, a mix, this, this whole uh, action plan is sort of a mix of things that we're already doing, which like I said, I think gives us a leg up in terms of uh, our ability to, uh, you know, build resilience within the watershed itself and the river in particular, which is just critical. If we have a if we have a bad algal bloom in the river, um, it, it's a problem. You know, it's definitely a problem. And if the temperature of the river uh, is so high that it, it jeopardizes our ability to meet our discharge requirements, our temperature discharge requirements at the point of discharge, that's a real problem. Um, so it's kind of a mix of uh, you know, things that we need to be doing, but we're not doing, but we are starting to do and sort of uh, relying on the current strategies that we have, but also thinking about what else could we do. So I'm happy to open it up to questions. Carol, you mentioned the fact that uh, you don't plant Douglas fir anymore. Could you no. say a little more about that? <clears throat> um, there are certain, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure you guys have all seen it. There are certain, you know, plants that are more susceptible to things like heat domes um, and burn, you know, burn, and, and the, the uh, Douglas firs are one of those. Um, also, the red cedars are really prone to it. I've seen a ton of dead red cedars. So, you know, as, as things get drier and hotter and they're drier and hotter for longer, which is what I heard the other day when I was in a meeting with Krista from some of the client, uh, the climate scientists, is that they expect it to be, you know, hotter, faster, and longer. And it's in some of the plants like a Doug, Doug fir. Um, and the cedar just aren't holding up well, frankly. And so we really need to start thinking about and, um, our natural systems people who are managing that program are looking at Southern Oregon and Northern California species. And they're starting to figure out which species would be more viable and could take the place of the species that are no, are no longer going to be viable as the climate changes. So Carol, forgive, forgive me if you went over this. I got pulled away by a shiny object for a while. Um, but, and it's been a minute, but Clean Water Services uh, was addressing temperature through shading credits for a long time. Um, and that was the main strategy for addressing temperature back in the day. Um, I believe that was good for about 25 years and was wondering if that was been shown to be effective and if that is uh, calculated into the calculations for uh, managing temperature increase. Yeah, so we still augment the flow from Hag Lake. I mean, the shade, the, sh sh the shading stuff we've been done for, we've been doing for a long time and it's good for 20 years. So we, we steward those, we don't walk away from it. We, we plant the plants and then we steward them for 20 years. And that's what our permit is. Um, yeah, so that's, that's still happening. 
Um, and then the, and the, the flow augmentation from Hag Lake and Barney Reservoir are, are really the keys to that. And in terms of the shade, I think, um, you know, it's kind of a weird calculation that they use in terms of calculating shade. And I, I you know, Bob Baumgartner knows it way better than I do. Um, but, you know, it, it's, it's a calculation that was worked out with DEQ and they're good with it. Um, it's a two to one. So we actually get, um, we have to plant twice as much. It's not a one to one in terms of shade credits. We have to, you know, we have to double down on how much shade we actually do. Um, so both of those strategies are really what gets us to, and anything that plants can do to reduce the effluent temperature um, is basically what we use to meet that shade requirement. Did that answer your question? Yes, very well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Carol, can you um, talk a little bit about the commitment to this plan and um, how far along that is? Like, has it had to be adopted or do you have the other cities' commitments to participating or just kind of curious about getting it kicked off and implemented and, um, and how that's going? Um, so there's a couple of, there's a couple of things going on there. Um, the plan itself, it still needs to go to our board, our, our board of county commissioners who's also the board for clean water services. And I think that's going to be happening in March. We did put together a climate statement that was um, signed off on by the, bar, the, the, uh, the board of county commissioners. So that, that's Mark Jockers is sort of leading that effort. Um, but I think that's gonna go in front of the board in March. And then once we get sort of the okay from the board and probably before, frankly, um, we will start to work on the scenario planning and some of the vulnerability assessments. Um, the terms of, in terms of the work with the cities, uh, the way we're, the way we're approaching that is, is really to sort of, uh, we're doing a cost of service st study and we're trying to work with our city and county partners on stormwater management in particular. Um, and Joe Gall, who's our utility services manager has been working on that relationship. So I think that we will get to that um, through that relationship building that Joe is, is working on, but it's, it's kind of in its early stages and it's sort of a paradigm shift for CWS in terms of our role with the cities. Um, so we're sort of working our way through that. Uh, and, but I think we're gonna come out the other side with a, with a better partnership that the cities are, are happier with. Um, so the, the short of it is, you know, it, we need to go through the board first. Um, we need to get buy off from the board and then uh, we'll, it'll be more of a public, uh, we'll be able to share it more with the public and start talking about it more. Uh, with our constituents. Thank you. Carol, uh, with the uh, uh, Willamette Valley, uh, there's obviously a lot of areas that uh, need careful attention and appreciate the, you know, what you're all doing and planning. Are you ahead of other areas or is this typical of what's being done, say throughout the state and the country? You know, I, I guess I'll go back to the, the meeting I was in with Krista. That was, you know, there was some somebody from uh, Washington, a small town in Washington. There was also someone from Boise, Idaho. Um, I think those were guys who were, were more city focused. Um, I think you know there there are definitely people who are in the wastewater that realm that are doing sort of adaptive approaches. They're not necessarily thinking out out into the future, but they're adapting as they go because they have to. Um, so, um, you know, most of the research that I did was on water supply uh, planning with because that's where most of the most of the information is, frankly. 
but um, there, there's people in that have done some wastewater stuff. I think, I don't know that clean water services is out ahead of it. I think we, like I said, I think we have a leg up because we do do a lot of work to, to uh, um, ensure the resilience of the watershed itself and the river itself, but that's just the circumstances we're in. That's kind of where we have to focus. Uh, and we, our TPS guys are awesome at um, super innovative and come up with all kinds of great strategies. So I don't, I couldn't really say if we're ahead of anybody, but I think we do have a leg up in terms of, um, you know, we supporting the health of the river, which is really paramount to what we do. Thank you. Um, and somebody asked a question about in, uh, whether or not CWS uses Envision or other rating systems for new projects to support sustainable, sustainability planning and account for climate impacts. Not yet. We did, we did use um, uh, a sort of evaluation tool to sort of test the, could we, we've been doing a lot of basin planning around uh, sanitary conveyance and uh, uh, upgrades to the treatment plants. And our, our, our folks did look at what the city of Portland did in terms of their infrastructure planning and did a sensitivity analysis on um, the sanitary conveyance systems, the bigger ones, and a bunch of projects came out of that. So I know we did that work. Um, I don't think, I haven't heard of other things, but that doesn't mean they're not happening. Carol, you mentioned the REEDS program. R, was that R-E-E-D-S? And could you say a little bit more about that? Natural systems? I'm sure, not, just. I'm not sure what you're referring to. Oh, OK. I, I couldn't quite understand at the time. Sorry about that. Oh. Um, are you planning for new large storage reservoirs? No. Um, well, I mean, that was the work that we were doing with the, Bureau, with the Bureau of Reclamation to try and increase the capacity at, at Hag Lake. And the cost was astronomical. Um, so, and we lost some of our partners. The city of Hillsborough actually went to the Willamette River for an additional water supply. And the district just could not bear the burden of the cost. So, we stepped out of that for now. I think we are at the safety of dams. I mean, Jennifer Miller might know more about this and be able to answer uh, rather than me. But I think we are sort of sitting at a safety of dams um, alternative, which is about um, seismic upgrades to Hag Lake. see one uh, uh, question here from uh, Jean Tupper. Can you share the link to this document with the group? Uh, I, I would think that we could. Um, Is that we, actually, not until it goes in front of the board. I, I can't share it publicly until they oh, have okay. a chance to look at it. Yeah, it kind of needs to go through them first. Sorry about that. No, oh, no problem. Any other questions or comments, Carol? Um, no, I think I just appreciate you guys giving us the opportunity to talk. I'm sorry that Jamie wasn't able to, to you know, join in. She's probably still sitting in that meeting. Well, you did a great job filling in. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. And anyone who wants to, uh, uh, get a professional development hour for this, please email me, Mike Unger at Comcast.net, and I'll, I'll send you a PDH. Anybody else have something they need to say? Thank you all for joining. Much appreciated.
Thank and thank you. you, Carol. You're welcome. Thank you.